Hey, it's Monday night. Time for Voice Over Body Shop once again. And for some reason, you've shown up. Uh, thank you for showing up. <laughs> thank you we appreciate so much it. for showing up. Uh, we have a great show tonight, mm -hmm. as we always do. An audiobook narrator and coach. This guy has done a lot of audiobooks. If you want to be coached by someone that does what he coaches, this is this is one of those guys. Yeah, Sean Allen Pratt will be with us. Also, we have uh, lots of questions tonight. Thanks awesome. for sending those questions in. It. We've got questions. We've got a demonstration of audacity that you guys are going to love. And we I'll talk about some new tech stuff. And some new tech. All right, coming up. On VoiceOver Body Shop, stay right where you are. We're coming right your way. Two men, twin sons from different mothers, with a passion for voiceover recording technology and the desire to make recording easy for voice actors everywhere. Together, in one place. George Whittem, the home studio engineer to the stars, a Virginia Tech grad with an unmatched knowledge of all the latest gear and technology in voiceover today. Dan Leonard, the home studio master, a voice actor with over 30 years experience in broadcasting and recording, and a no-holds-barred, myth-busting attitude for teaching you how easy it is. Together, to bring you all the latest technology, today's voiceover superstars, and leading the discussion on how to make the most of your voiceover business. This is VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, makers of Source Connect, Source Connect Pro, and Source Connect Now, VO2GoGo.com, everything you need to become a successful voice artist, VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success, the VO Dojo, take your voiceover career all the way. J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters. And by voiceactorwebsites.com, where your voice actor website shouldn't be a pain in the butt. And now, live from their super secret multimedia studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Hey now. Good evening. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VOBS. Whoopee. Yee-hoo. All right. Coffee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Powered by Co coffee. Yes, of course, I have the left-handed mug. <laughs> you know what? We need to get a right-handed mug. We need to get, so we we need to get like right-handed mug. Yeah. yeah. You know, we have these. People should, you know, if you want one, I, we, they're, they're Is the store still working? I, I don't <laughs> it's know. It's been a while. If not, we just haven't talked about take it. Take a, a white mug and a marker and put voiceover body shop on it. You go, hey, I got my voiceover I, body shop. I do shop believe on. we still do have a cafe press store, folks, yeah. if you're interested in having a mug like that. Yes. All right. Cool. Mm -hmm. And along with other things like yeah. shower curtains with their logo on it. <laughs> um, so tonight, Sean Allen Pratt's going to be joining us. So yep. we're going to talk about audiobooks. But this is going to, yeah, I mean, we've had audiobook people on before. I mean, we've had a Amy Rubinate on, and we've had other people who, you know, who really do audiobooks. This guy's done a lot of titles, and he's got a, a, a unique way of looking at it because he specializes in nonfiction, which is really cool. He's highly, highly productive. I, I'd say. Yeah. Over 950 titles. Proliferate. And I thought my 40 titles were really big. Uh, anyway, uh, and we've got some tech. Yeah, we'll talk about something that starts with... Oh, doom. I'll tell you about that I, in a minute. I think you got it. All right, so let's get the show on the road here. It's now time for... And back. now, the yeah, voiceover yeah, extra, VOBS News. The, music playing the latest and most loud. comprehensive voiceover industry news. Brought to you... No, oh, wrong, no, wrong way. way, wrong way. There you go. Success characteristics. Hey, look how lucky that VO, VO star is to be in such demand. Well, luck? Well, that's a four-letter word with uh, a few definitions. Even if you define luck as the result of being prepared for opportunities, 
that alone doesn't fully describe how some voice actors are on top and know how to stay there. In a new article on VoiceOver Extra, VO Pro and coach Paul Strickward says he observes three characteristics in colleagues who are at the top of their game. How many of these characteristics do you have? I'm not sure. Number one is something that call uh, that he calls the magnet. The difference between dreamers and achievers is that achievers attract jobs, Paul writes. But people don't become magnets overnight. He cautions, you've got to have an extensive network in place that generates a continuous flow of leads from multiple sources. Number two is the colander. What? Well, a colander sifts out the misfits in your career. In other words, don't attempt to be everything for everybody. And number three, the clay. Paul says the clay comes in as what you can mold into any shape, depending on your skills or the needs of your clients. Shape your work to fit their needs. Check out this article for more about how to shape your career to success. That's at voiceoverextra.com, your daily resource for voiceover success. Right. And our good buddy Paul Strickward, uh, back there in Pennsylvania. Uh, Paul, mm. great, always great to hear. We have to have him on again really soon absolutely you know, we've friend. got we have some great guests coming up over the next couple of months it's starting to rack up the hey. year is starting to heat up we're very excited we'll be announcing our, our upcoming guests at the end of the show tonight outstanding all right so what's going on in tech tech yes well <laughs> the uh it, the tech news is heating up too because nam show is this week so all the press releases are coming out they're dribbling out with all the new tech gear and one of the things that people have gotten excited about is a product from Universal Audio. I personally have, some, have been really into Universal Audio's products for some time now, and they've released a product called the Arrow. So for those that are familiar with the Apollo series, they've always been a little pricey and a little bulky. This is the first product they've made that's really more designed for portable use. And one thing that makes it so great for portable is that it does not need a power supply. It is bus powered. Ah. Why is that a big deal? Well, you know, the Scarlet is bus powered and a lot of other things just, when I say bus powered, just plug, plug in the USB. USB and that's it. Well, this one runs on USB as well, but there's a lot more going on in under the hood than a usual audio interface. This thing has DSP on board. DSP, define. Digital signal processing. Uh, okay. So basically a digital way to process audio instead of using analog gear. So you don't have to have a Avalon 737 or a Manly Vox box or whatever magic mojo box you have in your home studio or aspire to have. This one can do it virtually inside the box. So um, this thing sets a new price point for this technology. It's coming in around $499, which is quite reasonable for what this thing can do. But it, it has some limitations. Well, it, the main limitation really is the fact that it's USB 3 uh, only. So that means whatever device you use it with, whether it's Windows or Mac, it must have, and it does run on Windows or Mac, um, you must have a USB 3 port. Yeah. So for the, I don't know what's out there in Windows with USB 3 yet. I, I, there's a few devices, not that many. Um, in the Apple world, the things with USB 3 are going to be the new iMacs. The, I think actually the new iMac. Pro, I don't think the iMacs have it yet. Uh, the MacBook Pro, all USB 3. And um, I think that's it. No, oh, and the MacBook. MacBook, yeah. That little baby MacBook. That is a USB 3. Or Thunderbolt 3 yeah. jack, yeah, I but, say. but not my three-year-old Air. Right. If you're on a MacBook Air or an older iMac or a Mac yeah. Mini, it's not going to work with those devices. So it's... It's kind of a bleeding edge thing for new Macs. It's for it's for new Macs and, and really new Windows systems that have USB three. Now it's a little confusing. I'm calling it USB three. In in the world of Apple, it's actually Thunderbolt three. Uh, they they share the same jack, but under underneath internally, they're t totally different things. So just make sure you. I keep saying USB three. I think I mean this to be using. I mean to be saying USB C. C, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. C as in Charlie. Um, USB-C is the new the new standard jack. This this phone has it. Um, you're going to see more and more phones with this jack, the USB-C jack, uh, as the years go on, and more products with it. And the reason why it's so great is it's backward compatible with 
everything. Everything. Okay. Cool. It works with HDMI, Ethernet, vi- you know, video in oh, and wow. out, uh, Ethernet, um, USB, Thunderbolt, FireWire. It's all baked into one port. Wow. So it's pretty cool tech. So I'm pretty excited about that. We'll get to see this thing in in at NAM in person in NAM. We'll, we'll probably get to play with a little bit. So that should be Can't cool. Wait. Um, there's going to be a lot more tech coming, but you know we're going to really wait until we get to cover that stuff at NAM before we we share it on the show. We are going to try to do some Facebook Live from NAM. from NAM. Yeah. We've got the gear. The really bottom line is will we have the bandwidth? Mm. Because there's probably going to be a thousand, maybe five thousand people that are trying to use per, Facebook per, Live. per square section of the of the <laughs> convention center. This is it's yeah. a huge, huge show. Huge, and it's bigger now. Oh, they added an they, entire new building. Oh, Christ, they <laughs> they built a new building. It's called the North Hall. Right. It's two stories, and it's a hundred percent all pro audio stuff. Oh, cool. So it's like Can't an wait. AES show tacked onto a NAM show. I mean, it, it's it's big. So we're, we've got a huge list of vendors we're going to be covering Thursday and Friday this week. All so right. stay tuned on Facebook Live. We'll go live when we can, but a lot of it's going to come up on, uh, be posted on YouTube, and we'll feature some of it here on the show as well. All righty. Well, we got some tech questions coming up and a demonstration of the new Audacity. Mm-hmm. So stay tuned. We'll be right back here on VoiceOver Body Shop. Don't go away. Having dinner tonight? How about having some VO too? Voice over body shop. Have some voiceover with your dinner tonight on Voice Over Body Shop, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Stop that. Okay. All right, is 2000, 2018 going to be the year you take your voiceover practice to the next level? If not, you can go back to checking your email while this message is airing. You know, and I think there might be some tie left in the back over there. Uh, in the back of the fridge. But if you're serious about dramatically upping your level of success, I want you to go to a very, very, very special URL. That's a place where you go on the internet. VO, the number two, gogo.com forward slash VOBS. That's VO2gogo.com forward slash VOBS. Join the hundreds of VO practitioners around the world who have decided to do something positive and invest in themselves for this new year. Learn voiceover from the ground up or from where you are where and where you want to be. Voiceover to gogo.com forward slash VOBS. Let's make 2018 your year. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, They break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Stretching the limits of webcasting technology, Voice Over Body Shop presents Dawview 2018. Dramatic. Exciting. All right. (laughs) Well, nothing beats something new. Now, if you're familiar with Audacity, which I'm sure all of you are, it's looked the same and operated the same for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. It's great because it's a free software and a lot of people learn on it. And some people are making a living using Audacity. Absolutely. But finally, finally, they have updated it for 2018. Yeah, they really have. You know, after, you know, since it really looked like it was from 24. And the they of who's they, right? The, and, and it's everybody. Because it's, it's the user community that created that's it. That's right? right. It's, yeah. it's, it's uh, what do they call that? Not shareware. Open but source. Open source. Open source. Yeah. So, I mean, if anything new happens in this software, it's because a couple of 
people or a bunch of people wanted it that way really badly and right. worked very hard to make it happen. Yeah. So what's new in Audacity? Well, let's seen? take a look at it. Let's throw it up on DAWview. And here it is. Da, 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 da. Okay. You can, now, it doesn't look really much the same, but it does. If you look at some of the, the icons here, those have been updated. It's not the same old icon. Yeah, there's some facelifting. Yeah, there's some, you know, there's that. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the meters are, have a little bit more uh, detail, to detail them, you know, so you can resolution. really. So, I mean, if you turn on the, uh, the mic to start monitoring, it's a much more accurate VU meter. Oh, which nice. is really important to have, you know, yeah. make sure that you're setting the right levels and that you're recording it's properly. It's got the peak hold thing. It, it does. It still has that. It has all the same stuff that it used to have, but it's, it looks like it's a little bit more user-friendly. Yeah. Meaning, hopefully, they've updated the manual for it as well. <laughs> but it's also got this other cool stuff that I love. We're, we're real familiar with, with Twisted Wave, and we like Twisted Wave. Finally, they've taken some functionality from Twisted Wave. I'm sure Thomas didn't share it with them, but uh, but now using your fingers instead of using the the zoom tool, now you can just zoom in and out real easily. Just pinch spreading. zoom, pinch zoom. If you're used to that from an iPhone or an iPad, pinching will work just like that here in Audacity. Right, and you can move it back and forth like that. But it has something else. Yes, it has something that. I, you know, I find really important and that is a really much better, much improved spectrogram. Oh, nice. Look, look at that. Look at that. The colors mm -hmm. on it are, are a little bit more distinct on it now, mm -hmm. uh, but it has a little bit more functionality. I haven't had a chance to really work with the, the, the tools in it, uh, but apparently it's a lot more functional than the old uh, spectrogram on there. Can you change the scale from whatever this mode is to, to a yeah, less we, linear one? Yeah. Let me see. Well, I'm, I'm just poking around to see. Okay, if, we're, we're, to we're see just futzing with it here. Well, you know, it's like so, good software shouldn't need a manual. You know, you should just <laughs> be able to click around and figure it out. Right. Well, you and I can do that, but. There we go. All right. Yeah. But that's a much better looking spectrogram. Yeah. And, uh, but the fact that you can zoom in and zoom out and is, navigate around. Yeah. yeah. Now there, now there's a great trick that I've always wanted to show people. I was going to just demonstrate this tonight, but since we're showing the new audacity, I figured, well, we'll do it anyway. But anyway, if we go back to the, uh, the waveform, uh, thing here, if you've got a spike or something, you know, you could, you could use, you know, all sorts of different tricks to try and, you know, you know, if you've got a click or something and you want to just get rid of it, you know, and so no one ever knows it's there. You can use, maybe you're familiar with this, the pencil tool. Mm -hmm. This is something that Twisted Wave is oh. missing and hopefully we'll add one of these days. And look how they've improved the waveform in here when you zoom in. There's actually some lines there. So it's not, it's, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. Easier to interpret what you're seeing. Exactly. So if you go to the pencil tool, you can literally take each of these pixels each one of these little samples down to zero. And if you've got like a plosive or something like that, you can completely control it using yeah. this little pencil. That's real. That's a really useful tool. That's one that's been around in other softwares. I'm glad audacity has that as well. Hoping that, uh, Thomas takes a play out of the playbook here and adds that to twisted wave. But yeah. you know, this, this is something that is a real boon to audacity users for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is a great improvement for audacity. Way to go, guys. Way All to right. go, team over there. I know Paul Lysamelli. Yeah. I might be sounding his last name wrong. Sorry if I am, Paul. He's a developer of Audacity, and he's got a Facebook group just for Audacity users. Wow. So if you're an Audacity user, you should do a little search on Facebook for Audacity, because uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of helpful information over there. Cool. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, it's time to answer some of the questions that we get from our humongous worldwide audience you've Fantastic. sent them into the guys at vobs and if you have a question in the chat room anthony is running the chat room tonight hey thanks He's anthony a little under the weather so we actually had chance to watch the show tonight hey so, all right you know, and, uh, <laughs> so it's 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 great to have him on anyway let's go to our questions first one's from jackie bales okay right i think that's the first one yeah um does the position of a mic make a difference in the pickup of nasal noise I'll start by saying yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if having my mic upside down coming from overhead, which is the way this one is, um, closer to my nose makes it worse. 
and whether turning it right side up and coming from below would be better. Um, as George knows, my booth is a small 4x4, four four, and I'm working with a TLM 103, and the acoustic panels you recommended seem to be working much better than the foam. I would imagine I probably recommended ATS acoustics panels or something with rock sole fire uh, mineral wool, because right. those do really, really work quite well compared to foam in most cases. Um, okay. So na nasal noises, yeah, nasal no it's not a matter of the microphones. Yeah, so these much. microphones have a very wide pickup pattern. Right. I if, think it's a big problem with shotgun mics Yeah, because they're so directional. If it's pointed up, if you angle it up toward the nose a little bit, okay, like this, it might get a little bit nasal sounding, but I don't know. What do you think? You know, I've always thought that it, it, some people say talk off axis or something along those lines. If my philosophy is always fix it physically. If you've got nasal noise, no, one of the things you could do is clear your nose. Well, yeah. What kind of nasal noise are we talking about? Right. Are we talking about a whistle or just sort of a, a pinched sound or, or is it a, yeah, a deviated it a septum? Is it, yeah. Is it a nasal thump? The There's thump, a lot of different The, the thumping, you, you, if, if it comes out of your mouth and out of your nose, this guy's going to know it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so it's, if you're sta if you're at the right distance and using the right technique with the mic it shouldn't be a problem unless you're the one with the problem and that means clear your nose do what you can physically to eliminate it which also means relax and don't breathe through your nose right i it, mean you just breathe properly Bre breath control is so important uh, so with, with it, it really is and if you're working the mic really really close as sometimes you have to in a really and if your acoustics are bad then um, it's even worse. You know, you have the issues are magnified as you get closer to the mic. So if you are like three inches from the mic and you move the mic up and down your face, yeah, if it's in front of your nose, it will definitely be more nasal sound. Right, and 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 your mustache will rub on it as well. <laughs> so, well, if it's from, I often don't go from below up, and I think that's because often if someone exhales through their nose. Close, you get a nostril plosive. Right, and that's a the thumping is coming comes from that. Yeah, yeah nostril. A, a, you know, <laughs> a nasal thump. A nasal thump. Yeah, if you, it, I do it all the time. Sometimes, I mean, I, sometimes I put the mic low because I'm shooting a video, and I breathe out through the nose without thinking, and it hits the mic and yeah. it pops it. So I don't like it down there. Yeah. If you can avoid it. Yeah, but now with the spectrogram and audacity, you can get rid of that. Yeah, but that's a waste of time, man. I don't that's want to fix it. No post. question about it. Now point. she goes on. She has a question. More is important. Yes, too. yes. Also, when stacks are produced, and stacks are something that George produces for people that will help you with your processing. They're processing presets, right? What defines how many stacks you need? Is it mostly the level of projection, like promo, loud versus commercial, softer, or what? Should you have a stack for every possible kind of read? And I defer this to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> yes, you I'm need sure a I'll stack a for every single kind of read. Order them now. No, that would be unfair for me to say that because I sell them. Um, but to be completely honest, I have clients that have up to five or six stacks that they've made. And that's because they do five or six distinctively different styles of reads. They have, their, they have a lot of range. And they do, you know, sometimes they're extremely dynamic for animation purposes or games. And other times they are um, doing an IVR, which just needs to be very loud, even, and no treble and basically no bass, right? So there's, there are some genres that have specific needs. But sometimes people will send me three scripts and say, will you make me three stacks? And they read, whether it's a commercial and a narration or an e-learning, and they'll read them all pretty much the same. Same energy level, same dynamic range, same... But so different process. Yes, yeah, so then I'll have to decide, well, what do I do with this? Do I make purposely different processing for e-learning versus narration? What really are the differences between the two? Not a whole heck of a lot. I don't think much. You know, and, and the thing with, with, with any processing uh, is that these are not major changes that you're making to your signal. They're little tiny corrections yeah. for the frequency response of your microphone, the acoustics of your room. You know, they're not like four or five dB changes in certain things. Yeah. They're, Only they're, if it's a major sibilance issue do I dip that much. Probably, right, you know? right. And sometimes you just look at the microphone. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it might be the might not might not be the mi- right microphone, or it's an old microphone that's not performing super bright as, or as, brittle. Right, exactly. Yeah, I had that this last week. Had to deal with somebody with an old oh. Sterling mic. Oh, okay, yeah, really mm-hmm. sibilant. Anyway, uh, Larson, be- yes. Uh, let's see here, Dar- Darren Schmidt, joining us from Hawaii. It's not Schmidt, huh? Sh- no, it's Schmidt. Okay. You know, I thought that, you know, it, it was maybe it is Schmidt. I don't know. Schmidt. It, it's Schmidt. Anyway, <laughs> it's been my pleasure to recently discover your fine broadcast. As an enthusiastic enthusiast for dialogue and living in the country in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, my personal online quest is to find a hi fi audio connect solution for podcasting. Beyond decent sound and low latency bi directional calls, if you care to remotely podcast with what I'd call Tonal integrity hmm. would seem as important as not having a cymbal crash entirely mute the bass player's groove. Anyway, al- alas, as I am a cheap bastard, <laughs> at least you're admitting it, uh, the free route has led me to Source Connect now, which I couldn't get to work without digital artifacts in yeah. any consistent manner. Don't know, my signal chain could be very well lacking. However, recently I have had good testing results with Bodongo Call and Studio Link standalone. I missed the question mark. Where is it? It's in there somewhere. But what w- what would you suggest? Oh. Because he's you know he's he's talking about using Source Connect and all these things to do podcasting. Yeah, I mean, and obviously to talk to somebody else if he's interviewing or something mm-hmm. like that. It, there's sure are a lot of choices out there. Yeah, it's fun. It is interesting that you're having varying results between Source Connect now and Badalgo Call and Studio Link because those technologies all share the same basis. Right, they all work using the same underlying technology right it's something called web rtc don't ask me what that means but it, it's something that's baked into google chrome and some of the other web browsers that uh allow these tools to to function so if you're having issues with source connect now and not with the others the issue is probably with source connect now and the thing it's important to remember is that source connect now is still a free tool that's still a beta and it's ever evolving because they whenever there's a new chrome update they have to make a new version of it to work with Chrome. I will say this. Try their standalone version. Yes. It's not very well known, but there is a standalone version of Source Connect now. So you have to go to source-elements.com, go log in to your account, and go to the download section, and you'll actually find an option for Source Connect now. Yep. Go grab that and try it out, because that uh, bypasses the, 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 the concern of chrome doing updates right and causing some instability so if it's funky on chrome try their standalone app and see if it works better yeah. it might be I've, worth a try i've worked it I, i've used it works fabulous yeah it's, it's really, really it's real it's really, i love having it as an app you just click boom it's yeah. there you log in and you're on yeah so mr schmidt out there in hawaii try that all right well you know george and i do this for a living we take care of the home voiceover studios out there and in really talking with a lot of people, there are probably less than two handfuls full of people on the face of God's green earth that actually understand this unique environment that is That's a, right. a home voiceover studio. And nobody has built more of them than you and I. So if you need help with your home voiceover studio, whether it's designing it or updating it, uh, getting stacks for it, you can try calling Mr. Whittem here. Oh, me? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm over at George the Tech or George the tech.com if you like short domains you can always type in short short domains like george the dot tech a lot of people short circuit with that one <laughs> george the tech.com okay i'm all all my stuff's there i got drop down menus with different services we can work live you can send me your files and i'll send them back there's a lot of different ways we can work together cool and dan where do they find you you can find me at homevoiceoverstudio.com don't ask me how i got that great domain name but did you have to pay someone off for that? Nope. Nice. It was just sitting there. Sweet. I missed that one. Yeah, sorry. Mm. Yeah, I got a few others that I, you know, <laughs> I learned a lot from Joe Davis. Are By you domain t- squatting. Yes. By tesladealer.com when oh, it came oh, out. Oh, oh. He's, oh. It's, he's, it's like sitting there as in, the, in a bank account, just waiting for someone to grab nice. that one. Very good. Anyway, uh, our guest is Sean Allen Pratt. He's going to be joining us in just a couple minutes here. We're going to talk about audiobooks, specifically nonfiction, mm-hmm. but also some other stuff that he does. Uh, and his coaching and it, technique. His coaching technique and stuff about the audiobook business that you do not want to miss. So stay tuned. We'll be right back here on VoiceOver Body Shop. 
Are you confused about how to set up and maintain a professional quality voiceover studio? No wonder. The information out there is mostly mythology. This is the best microphone to use. You have to have a preamp. You need a soundproof booth. This software is the best. Your audio must be broadcast quality. Consult with someone who knows the truth. Someone who's been there, in the trenches, doing voiceover for over 30 years. Someone with unparalleled experience with voiceover studios, who's worked with hundreds of voice actors and designed hundreds of personal studios. He knows how to teach and cares about your success. In one of the harshest environments known to voiceover, your home. Dan Leonard, the home studio master. Separate myth from fact and get a handle on your personal voiceover studio. Contact the Home Studio Master at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Drop off a specimen of your dry audio for a free analysis. Source-elements.com. The creators of Source Connect, Source Connect Now, which we just spoke about, and uh, a lot of other tools. Some of them really great for voice actors, some of them more for post-production, and some more sorted for mus uh, suited for music production. But if you want to give Source Connect a try because you've got clients who are wanting to direct you live or even more so direct and record you live from their studio, this is one of the tools you must have in your arsenal these days. It's been around for over 10 years, so it, chances are the studio you're recording with has it as well. You should probably have it in your toolbox. If you want to give it a try, go to source-elements.com. You can get a 15-day free trial of Source Connect Standard and you don't have to have the little USB iLock thingy or work with without a USB iLock. And uh, you can give it a try right away. Just let them know that we sent you. We'd really, really appreciate it when you uh, sign up, if you give them any comments. And uh, we'll be right back with Sean Allen Pratt. Just VoiceOver Body Shop. Learn the latest in voiceover technology. Learn how to get rid of that... Voiceover Body Shop, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, on VOBS.us. We're back here at Voiceover Body Shop, and uh, our guest is Sean Pratt. He's been working, a working professional actor in theater, film, TV, and voiceovers for over 30 years. He holds a BFA in acting from Santa Fe University, New Mexico. What a wonderful town that is. Mm. Uh, he's been an audiobook narrator for 22 years. Uh, recording over 950 books, if you can believe that. That's a lot of work. At some point, he decided to keep track. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> God only knows how many amazing. he did before that. Anyway, joining us from Oklahoma City is Sean Allen Pratt. Sean, welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. <laughs> thanks, George. Thanks, Dan. Have, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's, it's great having you on here. All righty. Well, you've had a very interesting career so far. Give us a little bit of your background. You've been in theater and film and tv tell us how you got into that and uh and how you made that transition or are you still doing it uh, well, i started acting here in oklahoma city when i was about 10 and uh in school and then doing local theater in the area and uh went off to santa fe to get my bfa at 18 and uh by the time i graduated from college i was working professionally in the area so i was doing uh, mainly theater, Shakespeare. I was a classical theater actor for a long time, uh, but also a lot of movies. This is like late 80s, uh, so Young Guns, that whole aesthetic and Westerns was happening. And because I had long hair and I knew how to ride a horse, I did a lot of uh, <laughs> movies that came and shot in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, both domestically and foreign. And so I did a lot of Westerns back then. Uh, in 90, I, I moved to New York City to start my theater career and uh, did that for quite a while. I was a member of the Pearl Theater off Broadway doing classics. But in 96, I moved down to Washington, D.C. Um, I'd been there in 94, actually, a few years before doing a play at the Shakespeare Theater. And I met an actor. Uh, his name was Dan, uh, David Hilder, rather. And uh, one day in the, the green room, I asked him, what do you do when you're not working, As you, you know, when you have time to kill? And he said, I narrate audiobooks. And I said, what's, what's that about? I had never really heard about I mean, I sort of knew about it in the ether, as it were, but I didn't understand what it was. But that time, I was mainly just doing regional theater and working in New York. And so he explained it to me over a cup of coffee. And he said, well, if you ever 
you know, get down in this area, give me a holler and I'll uh, introduce you to some people. And sure enough, two years later, 96, I moved down there to sort of start my career over in my life. And uh, he made some phone calls for me and introduced me to a gentleman named Grover Gardner, who's a real icon of the audiobook industry. And uh, Grover was gracious enough to work with me and make a demo and shop it around. And uh, right out of the bat, my first two clients were Books on Tape there in Los Angeles. And, uh, uh, I'm, and then Blackstone Audio up in uh, Oregon. And then finally, a group in Albuquerque, New Mexico called Americana Publishing. So between all of those, I almost went full time doing audiobooks right out of the chute. Wow. So, yeah, I, I go back to the ancient days of recording on ADAT tape and uh, back in the days of early punch and roll on VHS tape. Yeah. <laughs> on VHS tape. Yes. Oh, punch yeah. and roll on VHS. Uh, VHS. Yeah, wow. that really dates me, doesn't it? Back when they really were books on tape even though they, they still sort of refer to them as that <laughs> absolutely yeah so yeah so I, I started recording and uh i just jumped right into it and it was uh, you know it was just when i got into it it was just going to be one more thing to add to my career as a performer because i was still doing theater i was doing television and film in the area i was doing some commercial vo not much uh i'm just doing um you know, and I started doing workshops on the business of show business for colleges and universities. So I thought, yeah, sure. If I have time, I'll just do an audio book. And so being, I was a carpenter. Uh, that's how I got through college. I used to be a house framer. So I built my own studio. Uh, my very first one. Yeah. It was a, <laughs> back in the day, it was, it was a, on the outside. It was like the TARDIS. It was like four by four. But inside, <laughs> it was even smaller. I used to refer to it as the Gemini capsule. It was so <laughs> small. I'm a big person, too. I'm six foot four and about 240. And uh, so getting into that thing was like, you know, climbing into this, you know, shutting the door. And um, Did it float, too, like the Gemini capsule? I, <laughs> oh, God, I wish. I wish. It felt like it sometimes because it didn't have any ventilation. So if I wasn't careful, you know, I'd be reading and suddenly I'd get, I'd start getting dizzy and I couldn't remember, why can't I say four words in a row? And I realized I hadn't opened the door in a while. So I was reading my own exhalation. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Just did you like figure out, Apollo 13. Did you figure out how many pages you could read before you'd start to black out? Or did I actually <laughs> did. Yeah. I, I used to have a timer. So about every 20 <laughs> minutes it would go off and I would open the door and, you know, move the door back and forth really fast to get some fresh air and shut it and start in again. <laughs> That's the but, traditional way to do it. See, yeah. now I find it fascinating that because we I've talked with Scott Brick many times, and mm -hmm. he too was a Shakespearean actor. That that apparently is really good preparation to make you more of an elite type of uh, audiobook narrator. Do you think? Well, that's you know, yeah, I do. I, well, not only Shakespeare, but I think theater in general. You yeah. know, as a coach now, I can tell you that those students I have who come from a performance background and mainly theater, but also film. Uh, they have a definite leg up on my other students who come in who don't have that kind of background because, you know, they're used to creating characters. They understand I can direct them, you know, using that director's language that we learn. You know, they know uh, uh, every different craft has its own nomenclature, its own language. Just like audio guys, you guys have your own language that you can talk about what your craft, like a shorthand, as it were. And who don't have that kind of background director. because you know they're used to director. You can, uh, you know, you can you can sort of cut to the chase on the notes you need to give them. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the theater background is important. Absolutely. Uh, now you specialize in something that when you know when I did audiobooks, and I'll do them again if someone offers me enough to do one. <laughs> uh, you specialize in nonfiction, yeah. and nonfiction is, you know, it's different. Uh, it's the only stuff I've ever done. I've never attempted to do lots of different characters and stuff. It was just, mm -hmm. you know, bio, you know, biographies, autobiographies, uh, you know, historical narratives, a lot of historical books about America's leaders like Jefferson and, right. and, and Madison and stuff like that. And, uh, which are, which are fun to do, especially if you're interested in the topic. But, uh, why, why do you like uh, nonfiction so much? Well, to back up just a minute, when I started, I was doing fiction like I think most narrators when you start. You want to, as a performer, you want to, oh, I'll do all the funny voices, you know. I can't pay the rent, but you must pay the rent, that kind of stuff. And um, I really enjoyed it for several years. But then because I was still up and coming, I wasn't getting A-list material. So I was getting, you know, this, this sort of same mystery or the same Western or the same 
kind of material. It, it was sort of repetitive to me anyway. And after about two, three years of narrating, I'd been nagging books on tape and Blackstone. I, I realized, I think a lot of people in voiceover realize the only way you're going to learn is by doing. So the more time I spent on the microphone, the better. So I was constantly nagging them, just send me anything. I'll narrate anything that nobody else wants because I knew I needed to learn microphone technique. I needed to learn how to uh, punch and roll and those kinds of things. And so one day uh, this big box came to me from books on tape. And this is the old days. They, used, they would mail you the book books with the VHS and the high quality cassettes that you made dubs on. And you recorded everything and proofed it and everything, and you mailed it all back to them so they could start doing the dubs. So this box comes, and I open it up, and inside is a five-volume history of the state of California. Whoa. <laughs> it, <laughs> written by the state librarian, Dr. Kevin Starr, a very nice gentleman. Thank God they were well written. But each book clocked in at 30 hours. It was a 150-hour oh. project. Whoa. And it took me over a year and a half because I recorded it on and off. But the thing was, is that because it was so well written, it finally dawned on me what I was sort of missing out of doing audiobooks, which was the intellectual stimulation. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, so I always tell people I'm really good at a cocktail party. Would you like to know about Bitcoin? I can tell you, I've done four books about Bitcoin. Holy do, you know they, you know, do you want to know about uh, uh, how do they drill for oil in the middle of the ocean? I did three books on the BP oil disaster. So I know that. Sean, you know, so now you've read four book writ, read four books on Bitcoin. Do you have any Bitcoin? No, no. <laughs> okay, that's all. I, that's no. all I needed to know. That's no, all I needed to know. No, here's the thing: the, the underlying concept is is valid. Right now, it's in the middle of a bubble. Yeah. So if you buy right now, and also if you know anything about how Wall Street works, I've I've done about three dozen books on Wall Street. Um, you realize that the only way you're going to make money as an investor in Bitcoin is to buy it at ten dollars and sell it to somebody else at eleven dollars. Right. It's the only way you're going to make money. Right. You know, and so, right now anyway unless you're actually using the Bitcoin to purchase things. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just did a book about uh, mutual funds a few months ago, and I've done so many books about mutual funds and investing. I actually knew everything he was talking about. Yeah, you, know, you, know, you know, that is in voiceover. You, as long as you sound confident about what you're saying, then. What the an list- amazing. I didn't even, I just never really thought about that. The side effect yeah. of doing all this nonfiction. Oh, oh yes. Learn tremendous you, amount. You have stuff. your thumb on what's going on in the it's world. Yeah. Amazing. That's the great I'm really good at a cocktail party, I tell people, because I know <laughs> a little bit about everything. Yeah. I tell about the third scotch, and then I'm like, hey, look at the weather. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, and you'd be great on Jeopardy, too. I would, yes. <laughs> I, 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 I find that the, the, best, the best narrators are guys who are really good at trivia because they've been reading all this stuff yeah it's absolutely so so the nonfiction. do you answer your question what made me interested in nonfiction? first of all was that it was interesting so it stimulated me intellectually but doing those books were, was really difficult now i know that you and i were talking uh dan we were talking before the show that you said you didn't think nonfiction was especially difficult to do but now that i know what kind of nonfiction you're doing which is basically memoir and biography those are actually fairly easy nonfictions to do because they tend to be in third person, right? Right. They tend to be. And it's a straight narrative. You know, I was born as a small child in a log cabin, and then I went to school, and then I made my right. – it's a very straight narrative. But what happens when you're dealing with a book on various aspects of PTSD or you're doing a book about the, the, the nuances of, of different kinds of stocks, both foreign and domestic, the, the, the nuances of the text can get very difficult and tricky to – well, l- let me back up. Ultimately, the way we judge a, no- a good audiobook is, is it entertaining, right? Right. And in, in fiction, that's pretty straightforward because a piece of written fiction is meant to be entertaining as well. And so the author has all these storytelling tools that get passed on to us as performers. There's the, you know, the plot, the characters, the dialogue, the accents, and so on. But in nonfiction, all that goes away. All you have to work with in nonfiction is the writer's voice, giving you their intellectual argument in a logical progression to illuminate their truth. Yep. yep. You know, and so there's no there's no funny voices, there's no zombies, there's no sex scenes, there's no car chases. Well, and in, so in if most you can't make that anyway. interesting. Sorry? In most narratives anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've been looking for those nonfiction books yeah. for a while. Yeah. I, I I take that back because, you know, there are some narratives that are really hard. I did one on 20th century Jewish philosophers. 
philosophy. Yeah. I still don't know what the heck the guy was saying, but that book continues to sell very well. Right. So it was either very well written or marvelously narrated. Uh, <laughs> Take all the credit. I, you know, you if, 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 an, if a miracle occurs close to you, you can claim credit. It's, it's, yeah. it's the way it should be. If you're just joining us, Sean Allen Pratt, master audiobook narrator and coach, is joining us here on VoiceOver Body Shop. If you have a question for him, I'm sure they're piling up in our chat room, uh, Anthony Gettig is in there tonight, uh, substituting for Jack Daniel, um, and he's uh, he'll relay those questions he's to watching us. Watching the Facebook comments too. Oh, so he's excellent! Calling him from Facebook, he's and amazing. From our on website chat room, outstanding. So uh, toss those in there. Uh, now, what's you know? I, it, obviously, they're they're both audio books, but what's the connection between nonfiction narration and doing? fiction narration well they still have the same essential truth you're trying to find the writer's voice and put it across and make it ultimately like i said the ultimate measure is was the book entertaining right and there's also a connection to me is that if you're going to be working in on in audiobooks generally you should have the skill level to go back and forth between the two but they are slightly different and in my in my world i believe that nonfiction is more difficult because it's more difficult to make entertaining Okay. Right. Um, there's, I tell my students that there's, there's sort of four obstacles you run into when you're doing nonfiction. Uh, the first obstacle you run into is you have to learn to repurpose the book because a piece of written nonfiction, a piece of written nonfiction is designed to be educational or informative, but you have to repurpose it. It has to be entertaining first. So if you don't make that book on Jewish philosophy entertaining first, they're going to turn it off, right? Or send it back. The second obstacle you run into is that the, most narrators, especially those who come from a general VO background or even doing lots of fiction, they, if you say to them, hey, we want you to narrate some nonfiction for us, what they hear is, hey, we want you to do some non-acting for us. You know, I mean, it's just a book about PTSD. It's just a book about Bitcoin, right? There's no acting. But that's wrong. There is acting involved. It's very basic. The, simple, the idea is very simple. You know, who are you? Who is the specific audience you're narrating to and where would you be with that audience so that the text on the page is actually the transcript of what you said to them, like a TED talk. Okay, think of it like a TED talk if I was teaching a class on Bitcoin. So I put myself, just like you do in commercial copy, you know, if I'm going to sell lawnmowers, right. you know, you talk to your neighbor Bill because that's a specific person. Uh, you're out there on the lawn talking to him about that thing. Well, if you're going to do a, a book about Bitcoin, then where kind of context would you be? Who would be your audience in that room? So that's so there is acting. Uh, the third problem that you have is you just have fewer storytelling tools. Like I said, you don't have funny voices or you know a plot with a killer chasing the good guys. But then the last one, and I'm sure you've experienced this, Dan, is stamina. Because yeah. you know, once again, it's just you, and that's I think that's one of the biggest things that I've found with my colleagues who come from a commercial VO background who do commercials and, and video games and uh, animation they have the talent but what i tell them is you better have the temperament to do an audiobook can you sit all by yourself in a studio with nobody helping i mean if you're in la and new york and you do a book more than likely you'll come into a studio somewhere with a director but i don't it's just me here in my studio so do you have the stamina the mental and vocal stamina to stay focused on the material hour after hour after hour and not a lot of them do yep no it it, it takes a certain kind of person to do it yes you know, it which, does which is which is why i haven't really done any in a long time <laughs> i got bit busy doing a lot of other things but uh uh but oh and it wasn't jewish philosophy it was jewish philosophers of the oh, 20th okay. century you know like you know max weber and Guys that I still, again, I had no idea what on earth they were talking. Talks and <laughs> loops and, and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, uh, Sean Allen Pratt is our guest. Uh, now, you are a coach, and people say you're a great coach. <laughs> so one of the reasons we wanted to have you on. But you approach coaching in a slightly different way. Tell us about that. Um, there's No matter what the topic, if you're looking for a coach, uh, whatever the discipline is, uh, there's basically there's two kinds of coaches. There's a tactical coach and there's strategic coaching. So let me give you an example. A tactical coach in voiceover would be someone you would hire to go in the studio and they would direct you on your demo, right? You get instant feedback like a director. 
And so what you're paying for is their years of experience as a performer and director. So it's an instant kind of thing. So you just bring the copy in and they work with you. A strategic coach has a curriculum. So I'm a strategic coach. I feel like nonfiction is very dense. There's a lot of ideas that I teach that are just mine that I bring to the table. And you can't do that in a back and forth session. So it's like taking a class where the students are required to do homework outside of class. They bring it in for me to listen to before I meet them, along with other things, because I deal with marketing and advertising and networking. But mm -hmm. then our session is more of a conversation. And we talk about the difficulties of doing that particular idea. And sometimes I'll work one-on-one -on -one with them. But mainly in my day-to-day -day work as a coach, I do strategic coaching. Although I say that, I'm just getting ready to start working doing tactical coaching with opencoaches.com uh, so people can hire me for one-off sessions if they have something very specific they want to work on. I mean, I can do both, but my preferred method is having a longer time to get to know the students. I'm very, uh, I'm very paternal with my students. I think of them all as my kids, even though some of them are old enough to be my parents. <laughs> it seems to be all the people getting into audiobooks these days is people yes. who are people who are very literate, enjoy reading books and want to share with they you know with how they enjoy a book with everybody else and that's really cool but Absolutely. there sure are a lot of them out there which is yes it's and it's and it's growing every day now george i'm sure you want to ask him a couple of questions about how he records his audiobooks yeah so, i heard a rumor that you're doing your audiobook recording using a headset now i don't know if you meant headphones or, or a headset, headset. microphone oh. I, yeah, not only do I, I'm headphones. I use okay, my headphones. Sony's but that, there's still ADRs. there's still a contentious issue there. But go ahead. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I have listen. I understand. Once again, it, it's a difference. I think fundamentally between, say, commercial VO actors who do, you know, I who go into a studio and they're playing what they do, and the engineers there who makes the adjustments to their performance. But when I learned how to narrate back in the days of tape, I was my own engineer from the first day. So I had that little, you know, remote control shuttle in the booth with me, and I had to listen for plosives and fricatives. Was there a thump on the mic? Did the airplane go over? And because you're, because of tape, you had to learn punch and roll editing, and so that's just the way I learned it. And so I prefer it that way. You know, it's it's what I know how to do. Now, on the occasions when I've gone into studios to record. Uh, st things with an engineer and a director, which has been very, very rare. Usually it's a commercial VO situation. Then I don't wear headphones. I actually just do the performance. Mm -hmm. So, but when I'm just by myself, I like it or not, I have to wear all four hats at once. I'm the narrator, the engineer, the director, and the producer. So well, I, maybe you change them all very rapidly. Hat, 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 yes, hat, 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 hat. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, you're thinking that way. You know, you're thinking, you know, as they, you're going along as the narrator performing, and then you hit. Okay, so let's say I hit a, a, a small illustration. Now, as the director, I have to go, well, wait a minute. Do I want to describe that thing? Or do I just want to notate it as the director to give it to the publisher to say, on these following pages, you need to make a companion download PDF. So now, as the narrator, I can just say, as you can see from table 3.6, blah, 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 blah. And then if I'm doing that... Or if I describe it, then I have to create new language to describe the thing I'm looking at. You know, when you're doing, if you've ever, you know, self-help is a huge category in nonfiction. Well, those self-help books have a lot of those uh, self-assessments in them. So you'll see a self-assessment on the page. And I look at it and it's small, it's, it's easy enough. And I decide as the director that I think the listener would enjoy being able to participate in this right now. So out of the blue, I just go... Let's take out a piece of paper and a pen and do the, you know, how lousy is your diet at home and at work self-survey. So draw a line from, the, you know, you describe the chart, you explain how it's going to work, and you walk them through the entire exercise. You break the fourth wall, as it were. But that's yeah. a directorial decision. Mm -hmm. So you have those issues, too. Yeah. All right. Our guest is Sean Allen Pratt. We're talking about audiobooks and how he approaches it and how he approaches coaching. Again, if you've got a question for him, throw it in the chat room. And we will relay that question to him in our next segment. In the meantime, we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back with Sean Allen Pratt here on Voice Over Body Shop. Skittles, taste the rainbow. She How's has fought for those who don't have a voice. The National Zoo. <laughs> Do I because sound semi intelligent? Just need to I stroke a llama. <laughs> Instagram. 
Download it and start embarrassing your teenagers today. Resolve spot and stain. Because the dog's gonna drag his butt on the carpet. He just is. $400 million. That's what the mayor wants you to pay for a new basketball stadium. Chickens were made to be fried. Sorry, buddy. KFC. Engage the droid army with this Lego Star Wars Republic fighter tank. (laughs) What? You've never seen a girl kill a troll? GameStop. Hey, I'm the cat meme guy. Come on, you know you love cat memes. Oh yeah, sure, sure. What's your thing? Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. You know, there's a shortage of mic port pros out there. That little guy mm-hmm. that you can plug into your mic, and so it's like a little tiny interface that plugs into any mic, makes it a USB mic. Only it's really good. But there aren't many of them out there for a number of reasons. You mm-hmm. know, and there, there are a lot of online liars out there claiming to have stock when they don't. Uh, after you place your order, they inform you that, one, they have no more in stock and don't know when they will, or two, we expect more units in a few weeks. Yeah. All right. So uh, either way, you're going to be, you're, you've tied up your money in this and you don't have one. VoiceOverEssentials.com. Harlan Hogan and the great people over at VoiceOverEssentials.com has 40, each finger represents 10, 40 Mike Port Pros sitting over in their warehouse and they would like you to have one. As of right now. As of right now. And uh, so feel you it and they're ready to ship and he does his shipping free very nice it, absolutely so even the manufacturer our good friends at Centrance aren't manufacturing them at the moment but they're going to keep keep manufacturing them but all their money's tied up in mixer face mm-hmm. we'll be finding a little bit more about that we will we'll be talking Same. to uh, michael goodman about that when mm-hmm. we uh, talk to the Centrance people in nam this week but if you need a mic port pro and everybody should have one Anyway, just, just, it's a good be in your arsenal. It should be. It's a great backup. There's only 40 left. If you want one and you want one now, like most of you millennials do, uh, all you have to do is go over to voiceoveressentials.com and look under Mike Port Pro, order yours before the other 39 people jump on it and get it first. Anyway, voiceoveressentials.com where you can get everything you need for your home voiceover studio. Thanks, Harlan, for being with us for almost seven years. We must be doing something right. We'll be right back. EOBS, proven anybody can have a show these days. Wow, this is VOBS? You're listening to VOBS. Minus four, are we at minus four dB? We're at minus four. And we're back. We are. All right. And Sean Allen Pratt is our guest, and we're talking about audiobooks and narrating and nonfiction and all sorts of cool stuff. But we wanted to ask you, what are you using to record with? Tell us what's going on in your studio. Yeah. Uh, I just switched over last year to Studio One Artist. Oh. I have a Mac Mini. Okay. Yay. Um, I, for years, you know, after, I, after around 2000, I, we, I finally went digital. And at the time, the only system and the person I was working with knew was pro tools. Mm-hmm. So it's been pro tools on my PC. And, uh, you know, I always joke that I buying pro tools was like purchasing a Maserati and running it like a Yugo because <laughs> it had way too many features. Oh yeah. You know, I'm just recording my voice. It's just, that's it. And so, uh, and it was always a little persnickety, a little temperamental on the, you know, the interface. And, uh, but I kept it for a long time. And then recently I just got fed up with it. And I said, you know, I, I, everybody was, you know, I looked around at the Twisted Wave, and, uh, Hindenburg even, and but I said, you know, a Studio One seems pretty cool. And I played around with it. But I'll be honest, I'm not a tech head. Uh, there's a reason, you know, I take my car to my mechanic to work on it. I know my limitations. So after I gathered enough information, I said, okay, I'll do Studio One. And uh, talked with Dan Barnes and his uh, his oh, apostle, yeah. as it were, uh, Joe Joe Brookhouse, and so Joe came in and worked with me and set it up, got my stack the way I wanted it, uh, made me a template so I can record uh, the way I like, and so I'm off and running, and I love it. I haven't had a single issue with it. Yeah. Um, Studio so One is a, is a Personas product. 
That's right. Yes, yes. yes. that's right. That's their yeah. answer to Pro Tools. Yeah. And, and I know yeah. Dan Dan Barnes. Is it Don? Sorry. Or Don, I'm Don sorry. Don Barnes. I think it's Don. Yeah. He, he's a he is a total guru with Studio One. Yeah. He's a guy yeah. to talk to for that software. I'm I'm still a total fledgling with it. I have dabbled with it a little bit, but mm -hmm. I don't have the experience yet. Well, like I said, you know, it's funny. I, some of my students come from a technical background with computers or they've been right, you know, they, they've been dabbling around with software and so on. And they want to try to figure it all out themselves. And I say, look, cut to the chase. You're only going to be using, you know, uh, of all the features you have, you're probably going to be using only 25% of them. Sure. So just learn those 25%. You're not recording Sergeant Peppers. You're just recording your voice. So you're just mastering it. You know, don't go further than necessarily you need to. Yeah. Because if you go off the deep end on this stuff, then you're, you know, you, then you won't get back. You won't get to the point of using the software. Which you're just recording your voice. And so I set it up for punch and roll. Uh, I have a little baby bottle, mic, um, And I'm, like I said, my Mac mini with my external hard drive. And it's a very simple setup. Uh, you know, as I, I I tell my students all the time, even as a coach, I say, if I don't have an answer for you, a technical, uh, an answer to a technical question, I'll immediately refer you to someone who does because I'm not going to pretend that I know how to use this software in depth. You know, that I'm totally out of my field when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. But I know enough of it to do the necessary things I need to do to make my simple kinds of voiceover. Because in our world, uh, when you're working for the major publishers, they just want the raw wave file. They just want the raw audio. Yeah. They don't want you to touch it. No effects, nothing. So by the time I finish recording chapter seven, because my ratio when I narrate is about two to one, right? Two mm. hours of work for one mm. hour finished audio. That's good. Pretty good. Yeah. And then it and then it goes right off to the proofer in-house there at, say, Random House there in LA or whatever. They proof it. They come back with fixes. I do the fixes wild on one track, send it in. Their engineer drops it in, and it's off and running. Now, of course, when you're starting out, you don't have that. You're doing all of it yourself. But even then, once you get your, it's all pre, once you get your presets and everything where it needs to be, and that's why you need an engineer, someone who actually knows how to use the software, understands the microphone, and so on, the space, like George and Dan. That's your plug, by the way. And uh, the uh, <laughs> then they can, you know, then they will fix that thing for you. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think in a million years of trying to do it myself. And I tell my students the same thing. Don't yep. go to somebody who knows what they're doing. So my system is very simple. And my booth actually is not a, a booth per se. This is a very quiet corner in the house. What you're seeing here is the, my microphone boom. And I actually narrate into the corner of the room. I've got all this soundproofing here. And what you can't see is I have this really heavy curtain that shuts off the space. So it's not, it's not, it's a sort of a soft, yeah. a, you know, like a pie wedge sort of, mm -hmm. and that is, that's quiet enough for what I need to do for my, for my audio. Yeah. And probably just lively enough. Just, yes. Not yeah. super dead. dead. I, I, someone's going to ask, cause just cause you didn't say, what is your interface? And what do you plug your mic into? Oh, it's a, um, I knew you're going to ask me that question. I just got a new one. Uh, it's an, it's an, uh, it's an Apogee. Oh, an Apogee Duet or a Duet one, yeah. one or a... Apogee One. Thank Apogee you. Apogee One. Excellent. Gotcha. Apogee One. They make cool. great yeah. preamps. They're, that's yeah. a really nice unit. And once again, here's the other thing. When I was actually putting the whole system together, this new system, I spoke with a, a, an engineer, for, a colleague of mine, Charles Lipper from Washington, D.C. I've known him for a long time. I said, Charles, just give me the grocery list and I'll go buy it. And so he knew what I needed. He knew what I wanted to do. He didn't. He knew it didn't need to necessarily expand in a lot of different ways because I'm not going to do video editing or multi-tracking. And he said, "Get this, 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 and this." And I'm like, "Okay." And he he knew all those systems, so he could put it all together very simply for me. You know, I'm not trying to become a production house. I'm just trying to work with me. And right. so I, I, you know, I've been extremely pleased with how everything is interfaced, and with Studio One, uh, and uh, and my clients did too. So I did a, a test recording. <clears throat> and then I sent it off to Tantor and Blackstone and Books on Tape and all the different people. And I said, here it is. And what they do in-house, of course, is they keep notes. So when they do their final mastering, they know what to set it at for all the different narrators. So it all comes out more or less with their sound once they do the compression and equalization. Right. All right. Ready for some questions from our vast audience? <laughs> all righty. Paul, Paul Stefano <laughs> asks... <laughs> How do you recommend aspiring or newer narrators slow down 
their performance? That's a good one. Uh, let's see. Well, um, when I was a theater actor, a young theater actor, we were taught this. If you ran over the text without really, you just said the text without taking the time to really take it in. The phrase we used was, you're not sucking all the juice out of the fruit. You're not using the text for its full dramatic value. And nine times out of 10, people who go too fast, uh, they're just skating over the words and they're not really taking them in. They're not using the value of the word itself. Uh, you know, like the word particularly in and of itself is a particular word and you can't skate over it. And then the act of, you know, uh, slowing down, you highlight that word for the listener. So it really becomes a matter of actually, on one level, you're taking the text in. That's a purely mechanical thing. That's a skill set. But then as a performer, you have to say, oh, that word, is a, it colors the rest of this phrase. And so that begins to influence the tempo at which you take, take the rest of the sentence. So it's a moment-by-moment -moment thing. Uh, Paul happens to be a student of mine. I hope you've got your homework finished, Paul. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, Paul is a very fast narrator. He's very precise. And so, you know, uh, he's, and as we've worked together, what he's done is he's learned to see the value of the words themselves and pull more dramatic value out of the text. Now, you wouldn't think that, of course, thinking, well, it's, it's e-learning or it's nonfiction, but there's a lot of drama in that if it's done correctly. So mm -hmm. it's more a matter of, um, and also sometimes if you have multisyllabic words, a lot of people want to skate over those things. You know, when you have a, you know, uh, you know, that the famous one, which is really isn't a word is anti disestablishmentarianism. Uh, this, you know, people want to skate over words that are multisyllabic or difficult thinking if I say it quickly, no one will really catch it. And there's <laughs> an old, you know, and I'm, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. and, well, there's an old, there's an old chestnut in the theater that says, if you can't hide it, you have to highlight it. And so what that means in the theater, it'd be if I was directing a play in a basement somewhere and there's a big concrete column on, this, on the set from right in the, in the space, I can't hide it, meaning I can't make the audience pretend it's not there, nor the actors. So I have to highlight it. So I turn it into a tree or a phone booth or a bookcase. The same thing happens when we come into big multisyllabic words or phrases that are you know, it, it, unique. You can't skate through them. You have to slow down. And in the act of slowing down, you highlight that phrase or word. And then ironically, nine times out of 10, that's the, that's the word or phrase that was meant to be emphasized in the sentence anyway. Mm -hmm. I love it. So, it's like jazz. I have a music background. Yeah. And in jazz, you, when you play a, a wrong note, mm -hmm. sometimes a blue note, you don't just, oh, I just made a mistake. Oh, nobody will notice it. You play that note and you right. hit on that note and you hit it and you hit it and you go, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I hit that wrong note. <laughs> Meant to do hit that. It. That's like jazz. Yes. So, I mean, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. JV Martin in uh, voiceover, JV says, Anthony, I'd like to, like Sean, oh, he was, I'm reading the narrative. I'd like <laughs> Sean to address nonfiction audiobook narration. I know that the big money is in novels, but I don't read or enjoy novels. I like nonfiction, factual stuff, be it politics or history and such. Mm -hmm. So can a decent living be made in nonfiction given the pay versus how much is how much work is involved in being an audiobook narrator? I mean, how's it I mean you, yeah, yeah, well, you're very efficient and you do would you say about a book a week? Yeah, I do fifty books a year. Yeah. Uh, which is insane. Mm. I don't <laughs> Yeah, just a tad. Uh, so let, yeah, let me. So let me unpack that. There's a lot going on in that that question. Yeah. So first of all, let's talk about let's talk about voiceover relative to the different genres. Sure. So within first of all, within the VO world, audiobooks are sort of the the low end of the pay scale because it's and also on the sexier scale because it's much cooler to have to do you know video games and and animation and you know radio and TV spots. And that's faster work. You walk in your, or your studio or whatever, and you're in and out in 15, 30 minutes, an hour or whatever. And you get paid commensurately much higher for your time than you do in audiobooks. So there is that. But once again, I think a smart VO person would just want to be working every day, no matter what they're doing, depending on what scale of work, they're, you know, what it pays. But the idea is you're always in the booth behind the mic. Then mm -hmm. it comes to audiobooks itself. Um, uh, 
I always say that nonfiction audiobooks are the ugly redheaded stepchild of audiobooks. You know, we only constitute about 25% of the industry, maybe 30%, which is pretty sizable, but it's not necessarily as sexy as doing a murder mystery or a Jason Bourne action thriller or young adult, whatever, or a piece of erotica or whatever. But here's the thing. If you can do nonfiction really well, there is a ton of work out there. Because once again, it constitutes 25 to 30% of the industry. And unfortunately, a good chunk of that stuff that gets recorded is not very interesting because of all those obstacles I discussed in the previous segment we had. So if you can learn to, to become an on-point kind of narrator in nonfiction, yes, there is a lot of work out there. And then, of course, that leads into other things like e-learning and corporate read, which you can take the same basic principles and apply to that stuff. And that, those kinds of reads can pay you a lot of money for your time. Absolutely. Uh, John Oak asks, how do you select your outsource needs for editors and mastering? Or do you do it all yourself? Uh, because I work with the major publishers, that's all done in-house. Yeah. But that being said, when I do a book privately, and I do about 10 books a year privately, I get contacted by authors via Twitter or Facebook, or they go to my website and they just ask me. And they, they're almost always nonfiction authors. Uh, in that case, um, I hire, I usually, uh, I'll work with a, a production house, say uh, Paul Fowley over at Common Mode in New Jersey or John Marshall Media in New York City. Uh, and then in a pinch, I also have my own proofers that I throw work to and also my own edit, uh, engineers that'll do the mastering for me. So I think if you're going to be doing a lot of, out, and, and I also tell my students Initially, they should learn to do all those jobs. That's just part of the paying your dues and just being knowledgeable about the industry. But the first place, the first place that you should always spend money in audiobooks to outsource work is in a proofer, a good proofer. It's people like Derek McLean, uh, who's starting his own uh, proofing company. Um, he's, uh, he offers really good services for, for uh, proofing because, and I'll tell you why, if you grew up pronouncing um, E-P-I-T-O-M-E as epitome and you proof your own material, then you're going to go, yeah, it was epitome as opposed to epitome, right? You need a fresh set of ears on that book. Nobody knows. You just need that extra, uh, you know, that new person to come in and listen. Uh, you can learn to do your own mastering, but then it, if you start booking a lot of work, then it's about a workflow issue. It makes more sense to hire that out and charge the client for it. And then you can just reach out to different engineers or hire a company like Common Mode or John Marshall to do all of that on your end. And they just send you a bill and you just pass it on to the client. I haven't heard the letters ACX muttered yet. Yeah. So is oh, that yeah. well, somewhere you so, find yourself in from time to time? I don't do, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I was around when ACX was getting set up. I was yeah. with, uh, I've been with SAG after for a long, long time and they invited me in as a, as a consultant yeah. committee when it was being done. Gosh, this is what, 10 years ago, I guess, maybe. It sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Five, six, yeah. Five, seven years ago. Um, Audio creative exchange is a wonderful place for beginning narrators to look for work and, you know, like it or not for most VO talent, you're going to be looking there initially because it is a different kind of voiceover. Um, the major publishers, the major audiobook publishers, Unless you have a really solid reputation behind you, someone like Dan who's got decades of experience, they're not going to be interested in you working with you until you've done a certain number of books just to get them under your belt. They've learned the hard way that someone who's used to doing 30-second radio spots will not have the stamina and focus to do a 10-hour book. They just won't because oftentimes they'll be booking you into a studio in New York or LA if you're local. You know, Well, you've got to do that 10-hour book in three, four days? Do you have the vocal stamina to talk for five to, six to eight hours a day until it's done and maintain that performance? So ACX is a great place to start. Uh, I tell the analogy I use, it's like for theater actors, it's like doing summer stock theater. You're going to go work your butt off. You're not going to really make any money initially, but you need the experience and the credits on your resume. Uh, but you can grow out of that. I mean, I, but here's the thing. I have students who will book work privately with an author for a per finished hour rate. And I say, go through ACX because it's owned by Amazon, which owns Audible. 
and they act as the honest broker. Because if you're not in the union, that way you can make sure the author won't stiff you for your money. Because if mm-hmm. you've agreed to the contract they've signed, until the author pays you, that book doesn't go up for sale. Or they make sure that the royalty share agreement you have gets split evenly. So they act as an honest broker. And that's, I think that's a really big advantage of working with ACX you know, initially uh, when you're start, starting out. All righty. Um, J.V. Martin asks, in a session, do you read from a hard copy? And if not, from a tablet or even a big TV screen or what? You, or are you a paper guy? Well, back in the old days, there was stone tablets, but then I've moved on <laughs> to, <laughs> well, in the old days, we had the book, of course, right? And you strap it down. But no, I use my iPad. Um, I just have the PDF on there and I just flick it up as I go. Uh, so in my studio, the, the iPad's on a, uh, there's a video I've made on my YouTube channel about setting up your, your booth ergonomically. Plug, plug. What's, where yeah. you, what's your YouTube channel? Just Sean Pratt. Just look up Sean Pratt on YouTube and awesome. you'll find me. Yeah. It's called Inside the Narrator's Booth. It's a really simple video. Cool. Uh, you know, the, it's the, the thing. A lot of narrators, when you're working on copy, they put the copy low. So they're doing this. Mm. Now they're closing off their voice box. So I have two shelves. One shelf I use for my keyboard and my mouse, then a higher one, which is actually this one behind me here. And on top of that sits a book stand and the the iPad sits there. So when I'm narrating at full height, I'm looking right into the center of the iPad. And then if I swivel to my left, I have my flat screen, which shows me my waveform, my program. And then, you know, to my right, I have my little phone and my really cool little phone stand. So I can see (laughs) everything I need to look at is all on eye level. Mm. So it keeps my chin up, which helps with posture and breathing and phrasing. Mm-hmm. So, so I use my iPad, but every, it's funny, uh, this last year, I actually got a book, a real book, a real physical book to work on. And I hadn't had one of those in years. It was very strange. <laughs> very strange. <laughs> um, for a 10 hour book that you're going to be working on, how much time are spent, is spent preparing? Are you a cold reader or do you pre-read the book? Um, if it's a piece of fiction, and I only do maybe five five or six pieces of fiction a year, you always read fiction before you do it. Always. So it's a lot more work, a lot more time. Yes, it is. But but you know what? If you don't know what who the mystery voice in Chapter 4 was when it finds out in Chapter 20, you guess what? You get to go back and re-record all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And there's a fam- you know, there's many f- famous stories. There's a famous story about a narrator who he just put up a murder mystery on this piece. It was a first-person detective, right? And the detective, it's all in his voice, and he narrates the entire book, and he gets to the last chapter. And, you know, it's uh, the case of the missing cell phone or something. And he said, okay, and so I solved the case of the missing cell phone. And to celebrate, I decided it was high time that I went back and saw my folks in Edinburgh, Scotland, where I was born and raised. And so, (laughs) yeah. So guess what he got to do on Monday morning? (laughs) Record the entire book again. So you always read fiction. Um, now, for new, new, new narrators, you should read every book you work on because the volume, you're not going to have the same volume. But what I do is I actually have a method I use to prep a book. I call it my three-step method, and I use it very quickly to get a handle, uh, biographical information about the, the author, the topic. Mm. I look at it as a director. What kind of research do I need to do? I, I look at it from a performer standpoint. But I think you, you will know, you'll appreciate this, having been in VO for so long. Um, I have a friend, uh, Jerry Dale McFadden, who's a piano player. He plays for the band called the Mavericks and Jerry's been playing for 35 years. We've known each other since we were kids. And, um, if you put a piece of music cold in front of Jerry, he'll know everything he needs to know about that piece of music in eight bars. He'll start, he'll start playing. Oh, it's the key of C it's cut time. Oh, this is jazz. It's ragtime. It's Scott Joplin. He's off and running. And he knows everything that's about to happen, where the break is for the, the bridge, when it goes to the minor key, when it doesn't modulate. And if you do enough work in, non, in fiction or nonfiction, after a while, you, you learn how to hear what kind of music that book is very quickly because you've done that book many times before. And that happens, you know, it's like a murder mystery series. Think about that. If, you know, if you're reading Agatha Christie, there's a certain formula to that. There's a certain tone, a certain tempo. Well, if you're doing a book about investing in Wall Street using you know, how to make money, there's a certain tone to that. The author has a certain style. No matter what the, who the author is, they have a certain approach. Self-help books tend to be up and positive, right? That's why they're self-help books. So you know that. 
And then, of course, over time, you learn, the publishers learn your style. And so you're also again and again getting books that are sort of in that your own voice, as it were. So I can, I can hear an, an author's voice very, very quickly with just reading the preface, the intro, and the foreword. And I'm off and running. I know exactly what's up, what is going to happen. I love all the, the music analogies because when you yeah, see really. a professional orchestra sit down and play a score, uh, which I've gotten to do one time personally in my life, yes. the Warner Brothers scoring stage, they pretty much sight read it. No, right. I mean they. they yes, and like, they had a cold read. Yeah, like I know, cool. I know this composer. Mm. We know this genre. We we pretty much. You're not going to catch us too mm. off guard. I mean, that's that's what comes with incredible amounts of experience. Yeah, absolutely. And so you and so you, I'm sure both of you have experienced that when you're doing VO. If you're, you know, there's a certain tone to a political spot, right? There's a certain tone or style to selling high uh, high tech stuff or stuff for medicine. Well, the same thing goes in audiobooks. Right. You know, you just hear it very quickly, and it's hard to describe, but it's one of those things you get after doing twenty years of narration. Yeah, yeah. You I know? I I found that you know, and 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 I discovered this after doing a few books. After a while, mm -hmm. you sort of take on the personality of the writer. Mm -hmm. You you totally tune into who this person is, what their yeah. syntax is, and you can almost predict what's going to be said next. Yes. Yes. I mean, you, you, I do a little biographical research on the author just to find out who they are. But ultimately, you go, you know, oftentimes you'll find a writer, if you look them up on YouTube or their website, and they might be really wooden, but their writing is very dynamic. Well, you always go with what's on the page. Right. Okay. And then if you use the concept I teach is this TED Talk idea. That's a shorthand. The idea is who are you? Who's the who is the audience? So when I narrate an audiobook, unlike in commercial VO, I don't narrate to one person. I narrate to the audience the book was intended for. So let's use the Bitcoin example. So in my mind, I'm doing a TED talk about Bitcoin. So everybody in that audience is a receptive audience that wants to know about Bitcoin. Now that might be different from an audience for when I'm doing a book for Christian audio about the nuances of the New Testament versus the Old Testament. Maybe these are young theologians that I'm doing a workshop with. And uh, so the size of the audience might change, but it's when I, well, the reason I do that is my attitude, my approach as a performer and as a coach is the text on the page is actually the transcript of what I said live. And that's what I'm, you know, in other words, if we took this episode and transcribed it and then performed it again, the idea is that if you do it right, it should sound like the, the lines you're actually saying. All right. Well, there's still a few more questions, and I'm sure people would love to talk to you and, and get the chance to uh, get them answered. Where can they get a hold of you? And especially if they would like to have you coach them, which, gosh, I would, I would relish the opportunity to do that. Um, they can find me on SeanPrattPresents.com. They can find me on Facebook at Sean Pratt Presents. They can find me uh, on Twitter at SP Presents. And, of course, in any of those platforms, you can send me a direct message or an email. And my email address is SeanPratt at Comcast.net. All right. Sean, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. This is font of knowledge. And I'm sure it, with the, the fountain continues to, to flow. <laughs> is that a nice way of saying I wouldn't shut up? <laughs> no, it was like we we're every, people were absorbing it, and we knew okay. the audience was very engaged in what you had to say, so we really yeah. appreciate you coming with us tonight. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep Stand moving by. ahead. Now there's one place Just where you can explore we'll everything the voiceover by. industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. You were great. You were great. Just we just went to a commercial. A voiceover career for a seasoned we're veteran we're ready to reach oh, okay. that next professional level. Stay in touch with market you trends, can tell I sort coaching, of like what I do. products, and services so, uh, while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources, and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, well, and industry insiders. When you I'll join you the online in sessions, Angeles bringing next, you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, me, okay? auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Very interesting uh, discussion. And again, 
they can reach you at sh- what one more time get that get that <laughs> plug in there okay so uh online at seanprattpresents.com you can send me a direct email at seanpratt at comcast.net you can find me on facebook sean pratt presents or on twitter sp presents and uh if you happen to be in Los Angeles this weekend, I'm going to be uh, a panelist at Scott Brick and Johnny Heller's big audiobook extravaganza they're doing. You can find more ab- about that on Facebook or on their respective websites. If you happen to be in Texas in February, I'm coming to Dallas and Austin to do some workshops there. And uh, if you go to my website on a regular basis, you can also see where I'll be teaching next around the country. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. you know, Johnny Heller and, and Scott Brick. You can't Great get better, better than that, <laughs> except maybe yeah. this guy. All right. Thanks for being with us, Sean. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. Uh, next week on this very show, we will have Tom Deere, who everybody knows is a real expert on voiceover business marketing. So uh, make sure you're here for that. On February 5th, the return of the one and only Debbie Derryberry will be here. She's bringing in the flesh, right? In the flesh. And I think she's bringing her band with her. In the flesh. Yeah. And that, that's <laughs> going to be fun. Uh, February 12th, somebody we've wanted to meet and work with and talk to, Tim Tippetts, who's also one of that handful of people that understand home studios. He knows his stuff. He is. Uh, and also uh, on February 26th, Roger Rose and right. Carlos... Alazqui, uh, how do you pronounce Alas that? Rocky. Alas Rocky. I think that's how you say it. Who is in, uh, works in animation. So, a great lineup of people coming up over the next month or so. Carlos Reno nine one one. If you ever watched that show, <laughs> one of the cast of Reno, freaking hilarious show. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, we got lots of people to thank for this show. Uh, you know, thanks to our donors of the week. First, like oh Andrew Kaufman, Jorge Infante, uh, Eric Aragoni who is just insane giving us money every single week. Thank you, Eric. We really appreciate it. Um, we've got donations from Shelly Avellino. Thank you, Shelly. It's so great seeing her name each month come up. Thomas Pinto. Tom Pinto, man. Donate. You know what? Donate to the show even just a buck so we can just say your name, name. every time. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, Tremaine Mosley. What else? We got more. We got more. We got more. Uh, that's the bottom of this list. Wait a minute. There's one more from bef- before last week. Yeah, I saw his name already. Just said Tremaine and Philip Sapir. Philip Sapir. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, once again, if you need help with your home studio, you can get rid of, you can get hold of this guy <laughs> at, you can get rid of, is that what you're going to, is no, that no, I, I just, it was totally, a, totally a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. George, at George, <laughs> uh, you can, you can email me at George at George the tech.com and you can find my plethora of services at George the tech.com. Yeah, and you can find me at homevoiceoverstudio.com or email me at dan at danleonard.com with no O. Separates mm-hmm. me from the rest of the Leonards. Sure. Uh, show logs, they're out there. Jack YouTube. DeGolia. Yeah. Uh, I, you, when the show gets posted on YouTube, you'll see the, the show notes with that. It'll take you Time right Time indexed and everything. Absolutely. Uh, we also have a podcast. Yeah, this version, this show can be listened to. If, if it's difficult for you to find the time to watch it, Grab it on Stitcher or iTunes. Just type in VOBS into any podcatching app, and you should be able to find it. All right. And uh, we do the show live Mm -hmm. because we're lazy. We don't want to have to edit it. (laughs) But it's more fun and more spontaneous that way. And what makes it spontaneous is the fact that we love having an audience here. And we actually do have an audience here tonight. (laughs) Yay. Get a shout of the audience there. There she is. Hi. Hi. Patricia Bouchard joining us tonight. Uh, Taking care of them. She must live in the neighborhood. She just keeps walking in here. Love it. Uh, And uh, if you'd like to be here to see the show, if you happen to be in the greater Los Angeles area, all you have to do is write to us at theguys at vobs.tv. Tell us what night you can be here, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, you're up to snuff. We'll pull a chair out for you. Exactly. Uh, Also, the survey. The survey is very important. Mm Mm-hmm. If you want to influence the show in some way, like suggesting guests or letting us know that we go on too long or that we do too much of this and not enough of that, you really need to fill out the survey. We uh, really appreciate the input. And uh, do let us know if any of the sponsors that we have on the show you're taking advantage of. They'd sure like to know. So please fill it out when you have a chance. It's right there 
I believe at the top of the page somewhere up there. There somewhere. All righty. And speaking of our sponsors, we need to thank them. Like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. Video to go go. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And J. Michael Collins Demos for providing an uninterrupted live stream and bandwidth. All right. Well, we need to thank Marcy for letting us be out here in the garage. She's a little under the weather tonight, so uh, she didn't even show her face here tonight. Uh, but uh, Also, J uh, Jack Daniel, when he's here, Anthony Gettig doing a bang-up job in the chat room tonight. We really appreciate it, Anthony. You, and our wonderful new floor producer, director, and switch pusher, Sue Merlino doing a great job over there for us and keeping it sane. Oh yeah. Also Catherine Curridan, yeah, our yeah. producer, booking all these great guests, which right. we've got a great queue of them right now. We certainly do. And Jack DeGolia for the show notes and Lee Penny, simply for being Lee Penny. Well, that's gonna do it for us this week here on VoiceOver Body Shop. We so appreciate you joining us every week and supporting our show and telling us what you want to have on the show. And uh we appreciate you coming out here every Monday night. And we know it's a hard business, but study hard, keep doing what you do, and success can be yours if you are totally dedicated and passionate about being a voice actor. That's going to do it for us. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VOBS. <laughs>